Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 52 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. Jay Davidson, and the topic of the show is fixing Lyme disease. Dr. Jay Davidson completed his undergraduate studies at University of wisconsin La Crosse, majoring in biology with biomedical concentration and chemistry minor. He received his Doctorate of Chiropractic degree at Northwestern College of Chiropractic in Minnesota. Dr. Jay Davidson focuses on functional natural medicine. He is a husband and father. He is also a popular speaker and a two-time number one international best-selling author. Dr. J was the host of the Chronic Lyme Disease Summit Number no. 1 and Chronic Lyme Disease Summit Number no. 2. He was also the host of the recent Parasite Summit and co-host of the Detox Project, which had over 50,000 participants. Dr. J. Davidson is admired for his ability to bridge the gap between the scientific health community and the layperson. His holistic approach encompasses the mind, body, and spirit— He works with his clients to formulate a simple, straightforward plan toward restoring health. This has gained him tremendous respect among the Lyme community and his colleagues. Dr. J is an ambitious researcher and clinician in the health world. He and his team of well-trained doctors work with clients virtually around the world. And now my interview with Dr. J. Davidson. Today's show is on fixing Lyme disease, and I'm looking forward to talking with Dr. Jay Davidson. Dr. Jay is usually the one doing the interviews, so it's kind of fun to turn the table on him today. So thanks for being here, Dr. Jay. It's great to be here, Scott. And yeah, if, if, just think of that like it's kind of reverse, reverse roles here. <laughs> You're in the hot seat. So tell us a little bit about your family's journey with chronic health challenges. What drew you into working with patients and clients with Lyme disease and doing the work you do today to really educate people about how to improve their health? Uh, um, I, you know, I think my story is so much like so many others, even, even like yourself, Scott, you know, like we get into it because of a need, um, never got into it like, Oh, you know, Lyme disease would be a great topic to study, you know, or, Oh, that'd be a great thing to have a, a practice on. You know, I actually came from, uh, the chiropractic world. So I'm a trained DC and, uh, ran a high volume chiropractic office where, you know, it was my wife and I, we saw over 600 patient visits a week, you know, um, so there's like no reason to really do anything other than that. Um, but then when my daughter was born about five and a half years ago, bottom fell out and, uh, my wife just didn't recover. And of course, immediately my mind's like, what if it's Lyme? What if it's heavy metals? Like these things that we knew about, but didn't really figure out how to address them, you know? And so our minds started racing and it was really through just her, um, getting her well that we're all of a sudden like, you know, the Lyme knowledge came and, um, and then her testimony and it spread. And then next thing you know, I'm working with Lyme people and doing the chiropractic office thing. Then there's no family time. I'm like, okay, something's got to give. So we sold the chiropractic office and, you know, just to, you know, quote unquote, the Lyme thing. So. Great. So one of the listeners asked, what were the things that you ultimately found resulted in tangible progress in your wife's healing journey? And then what are some of the things you would explore again if you were starting over knowing what you know today? Oh, those are great questions. <laughs> um, the, I really believe the biggest helper for my wife was heavy metal detoxification. Um, it was back in 2007, actually. So now, I mean, toward the end of 2017 now that we're doing this interview but you know so it was over 10 just over 10 years ago where we found out high mercury high lead tried dmsa didn't work next year tried dmps quote unquote didn't work right we reacted kind of put it on the shelf and so when my daughter was born in 12 in 2012 it was like what if it's these metals that we never could quite figure out you know kind of this looming thing Um, and really with all the things that we did, I believe the heavy metal detoxification was the biggest factor for her. 
which is a little bit of like, wait a minute, what about Lyme, right? Because Lyme gets so much attention. It's got the name. Um, I mean, obviously there's co-infections and all kinds of other bugs too, but um, it really seemed like for her heavy metals. So, and then you said, uh, if I went back, yeah, well. what would you explore again if you were starting over, knowing what you know today? Uh, I don't know if I would change anything, and I don't know if that's more of just a mind mental place because um, I feel like, you know, especially those that are struggling with Lyme disease, diagnosed or uncertain, and you know, chronic illness is probably a better category to say. So many times our mind goes, well, what if I did this? What if I, you know, I wish I didn't. And I, I you know, maybe it's a little too spiritual. But I just feel like then you're just, you're questioning the design, you know, as soon as you start saying that, like, I wish I had, I wish I, it's like, you know, all of our, we walk a path for a reason. And I almost, you know, right now I actually appreciate what my wife went through. Whereas a couple of years ago, if you asked me that, I wouldn't have been at that place yet I don't think Mm -hmm. mentally Um, so I'm actually grateful for what happened because obviously it's allowed us to dig deep and for her to get well for that so I don't know if I'd actually change anything but I know what you're saying or I know what the listener was saying you know protocol wise is I would have dove into parasites like ASAP okay cool and we'll get into that for sure so I know people will want to know how is your wife doing today oh she is the healthiest she has ever been um it's really amazing when you, uh, I, I should, uh, she, I should pull her in here. Um, she's in a different, <laughs> different room here now, but, um, she, when you look at her, she's like this beaming light. I mean, just healthy, happy. And it's amazing to think that that could even happen when she, I mean, she was literally, you know, uh, on her deathbed where, I mean, two months in from pregnancy, she had to stop breastfeeding couldn't function, couldn't eat, basically was forced into fasting and I mean, lost, you know, 40, 50 pounds of baby weight like that. Cause you know, just in, and from going to that, to this, like, huh, it's, it's what gets me motivated. It gets me up in the morning, you know? Um, awesome. and, uh, and she's not an anomaly, you know, there's so many people that are able to recover. There's so many people that are able to heal and get well. And, um, for you listening, you know, if you're struggling, just know there's hope. Totally agree. Totally agree. So what do you see as some of the common denominators in someone that has Lyme disease that we really need to explore to make some significant traction in terms of moving towards wellness? And then what are some of the things that hold people back from realizing their full health potential? So shorten that up for me a little bit. I mean, the biggest factors with Lyme disease? Yep. I really think it comes down to um, and I must say that Scott, you're like the, the most prepared interviewer <laughs> I've ever had. I love it. Um, so I just kudos Thanks. to you. And, and, um, I just, the people that follow you are like, you know, they need to for a reason, you know, you just, Thanks. you're such a wealth of knowledge and bringing, bringing, bringing people in that know stuff. So it's, it's super cool. Thank you. Um, when I look at the cause or causes of, you know, people not doing well, especially in the Lyme world. Lyme and co-infections is one big category. Parasites is a huge category. I feel like there's been so much breakthrough in the last year or two uh, in that clinically what I've seen. Uh, Number three, I would say is toxicity, specifically heavy metals. I think heavy metal toxicity is a big epidemic. Uh, And then the fourth thing I would say is mold. And I don't want to like push off the mental mind emotional trauma stress thing at all because I feel like that's a really big piece to the puzzle as well too but uh, mold heavy metal parasite lime I think if those four things are addressed your life is going to absolutely change and are there any specific things that you see kind of holding people back from realizing their health potential so they're exploring some of those things but are there common denominators in terms of the things that you constantly see ah that's the thing that's holding back a number of patients or clients mold there's this there's this attachment issue people get into um but we love the house but there's no way that it could make us sick well i need i need my job and it's sick building syndrome at work you know i mean i feel i feel the thing that can hold us back is um holding on to things that we need to let go of 
And oftentimes it's physical things, especially in the mold mm -hmm. category. And I feel like, you know, God's just testing you or us in those circumstances of what's actually more important, you know, like stuff, health, like, um, so mold definitely is a big, um, a big barrier. If somebody's got it, like, it doesn't matter the protocol you're going to go on. It doesn't matter the adrenal formulas. You're going to have chronic fatigue. You're, you're just going to hit a wall. It's going to be a barrier. That's a big one. Um, parasites, mm -hmm. what I've seen clinically, because I I'd done parasite cleanses before. I'm like, oh, must not have any issues, right? Didn't notice anything. Didn't see any changes. And I feel like ineffective parasite protocols is a, is a hang up because as soon as you do one, you think I did that and I'm good. Um, and then heavy metal detoxing too, not doing it long enough. And I would say the same thing happens with heavy metal detox that oftentimes I hear people that say, Oh, I've done IV chelation and I did 10 IVs. And so I got the check mark and I'm like, metals are something we encounter on a daily basis. And at least from my perspective, detoxification is a lifelong process if we want to really be healthy. And so that's another example as well, where oftentimes I hear people say, well, I couldn't have metals because I did these 10 IVs. And I'm like, eh, I don't think that's going to cut it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. For sure. It's, it's, you know, you can empty the body tissues in a couple months, two, three, maybe four months. Um, but the key with heavy metal detoxification is getting mercury out of the brain. It's getting aluminum out of the brain. It's get, it's clearing lead out of the bone that's been stored there, you know, and um, unless you do that, the symptoms are just going to keep reoccurring because you're not digging down deep enough. So it is, it's definitely a process for sure. And super big fan of staying away from IV chelation as well. So you mentioned Lyme and co-infections is one of the four big things to explore. So what are some of the tools that you use, antimicrobial support and so on, for dealing specifically with Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, and those Lyme-related infections? Um, I This might sound weird. Lyme and the co-infections is like last. So if you were to ask like order, figuring out if mold is an issue or not, like is always immediate remedy or worst case is move, sell your stuff, right? Like that's, I mean, the worst case possible. Mold right away, parasites, heavy metal detox. And then, I mean, rarely do you need a lot of quote unquote killing things for the smaller pathogens like the viruses, the bacteria like Borrelia, Babesia. Well, it's really more a parasite, but uh, you know, Bartonella or Lichia, those kind of things, uh, human herpes viruses. So, I mean, Byron White's got some good, good formulas. We've, we've chatted about that before. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of those. They're strong though. So you have to know how to use them. I do. I mean, I like basic immune boosters though, too. Um, beta glucan, I think is a great, great, uh, immune booster, but not right for everybody. Um, definitely like to energetically test to see, you know, what, what's right for somebody and what's not. So kind of, I, I like to combine and I know we've chatted about this, uh, over the years here. I like to look at really clinically, you know, like for each case, what seems to have worked the best for people, um, similar to like the client I'm working with, for instance. And then also, so, and then like to think about it in phases. So what phase are you in? Kind of get the list of like what could be tools and then energetically test and say, okay, out of this, you know, 12, what might be best for you, Scott? Like, and it goes down to three, you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of in that right now from a clinical uh, aspect, but I like the vitamin C, um, you know, higher doses of vitamin C, four grams or more is therapeutic. I think that can be beneficial. Um, I mean, there's just tons of stuff out there, right? Like Buner's, Buner's herbal protocols, uh, you know, there's Veritrol, like the Japanese nutwood. I mean, there's so many benefits of that. But I just don't, I don't find that you like need a ton of antimicrobial stuff for those little guys when you basically peel the shield away from Lyme. And it's co-infections kind of expose them because our immune system's awesome. So, so you're basically saying that it's the terrain and not the bug, and that if we work on the terrain through detoxification of metals and and reducing exposure to mold and all of those things, that then the microbes themselves don't require as big of a gun to address once you do that towards the end. Love that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I would absolutely. definitely agree, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I agree as well. 
So you mentioned parasites and you just hosted a fantastic parasite summit recently. So what were some of the, I mean, you know lots about parasites already, but what were some of the things that you took away that were kind of new information that you really learned something and went, wow, I hadn't heard that before, or this is really critical. Uh, One thing that really connected the dots, Dr. Dale Kelly was talking about the pancreas, diabetes, and parasites. And I feel like he just I mean, clinically, I feel like you just don't hear a lot about parasites, maybe more till recently. Obviously, the Parasite Summit is, you know, helping kind of get the word out more on this epidemic that we're in or that we have. But, um, you know, it really connected clinically blood sugar. When you see somebody's, like when they run, you know, standard blood work and you've got glucose on there and you've got glucose that's in the, you know, low 90s, which is quote unquote normal by standards, but you're like, that's, that's too high. And what I've seen, like when you start clearing worms out is the glucose starts going down. So I I guess that was kind of a big, that was a big one for me, like the pancreatic flukes and things that can affect blood sugar, the pancreas itself. And then, I mean, the liver, I've always been a big fan of liver drainage, you know, opening that up and really giving a lot of attention and liver has such a big role with glucose too. So that was a big one. Um, I think probably the biggest takeaway was how much parasites need to almost be like early on, on almost everybody's protocol and how connected they are to mold, heavy metals and, you know, Lyme disease and its co-infections. I mean, parasites, you know, Dr. Alan McDonald uh, has found Lyme living in nematodes, which is a type of parasite. So if you've been battling chronic Lyme for a couple of years, no matter if you're doing natural or antibiotics or anything in between and hitting a wall, it could just be the fact that, you know, Lyme's protected within the parasite. Uh, Mold spores. I think Dr. Klinghart might even have said this too, you know, mold spores live inside parasites. So you remove yourself from the, you know, moldy environment, but still have mold illness. It can be the spores releasing from the parasite. So And then the whole idea too with the heavy metal connection, just the fact that parasites are sponges for heavy metals. And a lot of times that's often why the body will allow them to be there because they're protecting you from this toxicity of heavy metals that we're in. So it's hard to, it's hard to pick, but um, those are definitely some, I think, key takeaways. Yeah. And you had one of my all time favorites on that summit as well, which is Anne Louise Gittleman. She was, when Mm -hmm. I first got sick uh, 20 years ago now, her book, Guess What Came to Dinner was one of the first books that I picked up and I had the (laughs) um, wonderful opportunity to have dinner with her a couple of months ago. And and to me, that was just like meeting my celebrity kind of, yes, like very, very cool. So how often would you say that you find parasites are a factor in your clients? And then what are some of your favorite tools for dealing with parasites? And then do the tools need to be different for worm type helminth nematode parasites versus more protozoan or smaller parasites? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions there. <laughs> so, uh, parasites like hundred percent of the time, I, I just assume everybody's got parasite issues. Like in, you know, I even was actually discussing with a veterinarian recently, um, about parasites, like in the San Diego area, just chatting with her and, She's like, oh, we, we always run a stool test, you know, and hardly anybody around here has parasites animal-wise. And I'm just like, but how accurate is that test? And she's like, well, you know, it really depends on the area. I mean, if you're in, you know, versus San Diego where I live, you know, now, you know, if you're in Texas or Florida, then there's a bigger issue. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't jive with kind of the fact, you know, you have to run a stool test because they're all negative. But yet when you do parasite cleanses and you see people clear stuff out of them, it's like, there's your, you know, there's your confirmation there. So I, I really, from a, from a clinical basis, I'm going to assume, you know, like if I was working with Scott, I'm just going to assume you have parasites and that's got to be part of the agenda. And if we start seeing stuff come out or you start maybe having some symptoms and we're like, okay, this is a bigger issue than we thought, you know, we extend that time period or you're like, not a big deal. I can take a lot of Mosaputica. I can take, you know, a bunch of other antiparasitics and, you know, not have any issues. Well then, you know, maybe it's not as big of a deal for you as it is for some other people and kind of move on to the next phase. Is it fairly common for your patients to see some parasites exiting the body when you put them on a parasite protocol? (sighs) It's hit or miss. I mean, some people they're like, 
some people within 24 hours, I mean, I'm seeing stuff come out, you know, and then, you know, and it, 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 it varies, right? It's the quote unquote rope worm to little sesame seeds to thin spaghettis to, you know, all kinds of, it, it, it's unbelievable the pictures I get. And yeah. there was one, I have to say this, um, you know, I've just got my phone, you know, sitting right here and there was one day where uh, a client had texted me a picture of like what came out of me and it dinged right as we were sitting down for dinner. And I was like, oh, text, right? Go over and check. I'm like, that's a quick lesson. Just leave the phone alone. It's family time and dinner because it was a big old pile of worms and stuff. Um, probably like, you know, I'd say 30 to 40% of the time people f- see stuff. You know, I think of, you know, Anne Louise Gittleman, um, you know, she's been such monumental in this parasite world. She says there's 134 different species of parasites. Um, I can't remember if she quoted this, but somebody else has, uh, or multiple people I think have mentioned really, you know, only about 30% of the worms are actually visible to the naked eye. So, um, I don't know, def- definitely not everybody sees stuff, but I mean, I have, my wife has, you know, I've seen stuff come out of my daughter. Um, and I guess it depends how much you're poking your poo and also like analyzing it too. And when you're doing a parasite protocol, is the focus on the larger parasites or are you also incorporating things for protozoan parasites? Uh, both, both. But from, I guess, clinically what I've seen, big worms first and then the small ones start coming out. And I'm not sure exactly like, the mechanism or little ones in the big ones or big ones are priority and the body wants to get rid of those first before the little ones. But like I think about my own case, um, you know, one of our mutual friends, Dr. Todd Watts, he was showing me pictures on his phone um, a few years ago at a seminar. And I was like, gosh, what are those things coming out of people, you know, and his like famous worms and stuff like that. And I'm like, I want to try this out. So I started taking it and within about, um, 16 days or so I saw like a something poking out. So I kind of poked my stool and it was like a six inch worm. Like, wow. Okay. And then he gave me, um, kind of his original formula, just straight up mimosa pudica seed by itself. And five or six days later, I mean, two 20 inch, like cylindrical worms. Like it's not like, you know, globby rope worm stuff that people are talking about, like cylindrical. I'm like, this is disgusting. And the next month and a half then, uh, cause I literally had to, you know, take some toilet paper and slowly pull them out. Just, it's gross to think about, but it's grosser to think that that stuff's living in us. Right. And we're just like letting better, it better out than in. Yeah. 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 And the words of Shrek better out than in for sure. Um, and then, you know, so I got the two 20 inch worms out and then the next month and a half, there were like five to seven inch worms. And then, you know, I was like, Oh, I must be done. And not understanding the whole life cycle of parasites, like they replicate essentially every two weeks, roughly a full moon, new moon type of thing. You know, it's like, oh, I'm done. Kind of put on the back burner. I'm like, hmm, gut feels like it's, you know, getting some symptoms, went back on, started clearing more worms out. And eventually what my, what I like to tell people now is be persistent and be consistent in the parasite category. Cause you just don't know when they're going to be hatching. And you know, if you get a bunch out and you're like, oh, that was awesome, I'm done. It's like, well, what about the eggs? What about the other life cycles, you know, and the whole hatching? Like, you know, you want to keep going to really clear those out. So um, after the five to seven inch, then I had pinworms. That was a, a big issue that I had. So, and I guess I've seen that just clinically. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you've seen that too, but it seems like big ones first and then it goes to smaller, like the, especially people that have the quote unquote rope worms or the you know, mucus associated lymph tissue and the real thick sludgy stuff that can take the longest. Cause I feel like it's just clogs up and, you know, some people just, it's hard to get things moving and to clear it out. But, um, you know, you clear that out, then there's all kinds of other stuff that'll come, which, you know, the protozoa, the, the smaller, you know, parasites I, I feel like need to be addressed after the big ones. And do you feel then like you need to change the strategy to a different herb, for example, or is there some thought that mimosa may also help people with the protozoan organisms as well? It's a great question. Um, one of the things that came up a lot after the parasite summit was this whole idea of when you take something, are you exploding the worm? And I think it was maybe Dr. Klinghart that brought this up. 
you know, exploding the worm and causing whatever's in the worm to, you know, be released? Or are you um, kind of bringing it out whole? And I, you know, there's just not a lot of research on Mimosa Pudica. Um, and there's more and more stuff just recently coming out on PubMed, but it's, I feel like it's just not been utilized very much. And then obviously there's different forms, the plant, the bark and the seed and things. Um, I'm a huge fan of the seed, but um, I believe part of the mechanism of Mosa is suffocation. Like I feel like it suffocates worms out, but it does from at least what I've seen clinically is it works, it works systemically too. So it means that there's gotta be herbal properties that are probably anti-parasitic in nature. And there's gotta be like this, you know, cause if you just put the, the seed in, in a glass of water, it'll gel up and coagulate, which I feel like is part of the suffocation effect. And then of course, some people will say, Oh, it's, I'm just, pooping out the capsule and it's like but if i actually have a bottle right here you know if i was to take um eight caps of this right now like i wouldn't see any changes in my stool but other people might see stuff come mm -hmm. out you know so yeah so i'm like well it's not it's not just that i really think it's to do with your interior you know digestive train but basically mimosa i feel like works really well for ropeworm or you know M A L. M-A-L-T or whatever you want to call that. Um, I feel like it works really well for uh, some larvae forms like strongyloides and things like that too. Beyond what else it actually works well for, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But I, I kind of classify mimosa in the category though that it's, a, it's kind of a binder more than like maybe a black walnut or a wormwood, you know what I mean? Where it's like one of those real potent herbs that maybe you don't want to take forever. Most I kind of put more in the binding of the parasite category where it's safe. You can take it more longer term. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. That's a, a good update on your personal situation. I hadn't heard that it, that it had several other phases before. So <laughs> that's interesting. So let's talk a little bit about toxicity. You talked about the importance of mold and mold toxins. You talked about heavy metals. How important is detoxification in helping someone to recover from Lyme disease? And then what are some of your favorite tools? It's so important. So important. And that's where I feel like the Lyme world, like, I mean, that's probably like the name, like if my name ever gets mentioned, it's probably like Lyme gets thrown in there. I, I think in order, I really believe in order to get people well, it's not even that like detoxification for my wife, for instance, was huge. And why I feel like it, it becomes the protector. It becomes the shield. It becomes the armor for these bugs. And so if you're trying to battle the bugs when they're all fully armored up, like you're just asking for a world war three in your body. And I just, I don't think it has to happen. So chemical wise, there's so many out there. We share one atmosphere on this world. So what happens in China is going to affect us here. We're on the West coast. So we get, you know, radiation extra. Um, I mean, detoxification is like it, it's not even, it's not even a choice. It's a requirement in this day and age right now. I totally agree. And it, when I started out working with Dr. Klinghart many years ago, this is 2006, you know, I thought the bugs were the most important, the toxicity was next. And then the emotional mental stuff was kind of, yeah, that stuff that I don't need to worry about. And I ended up flipping it completely, ultimately, that detox was much more important than dealing with the microbes. And so it sounds like we're on the same page that the detox is a really high priority. So let's then talk a little bit about some of the options to support detoxification. So binders is usually the first thing that someone thinks about to help get some of the toxins excreted from the system. Are there specific binders that you prefer to use in your clinical work? Yeah, yeah. And it's been, it's been changing, you know, over the years. Um, there's so many good binders that are out there from, I mean, I remember back in 20. This was actually my wife when we actually went down to Florida, 2008. I mean, they had a powdered activated uh, charcoal, right? Like an activated carbon charcoal. And we started using it then and saw big benefits just to plain charcoal. And there's a lot of them that's still out there. There's just really great options out there now. Um, so I'm a big fan of charcoals. Big, um, there's, there's clays that seem to work well. I think Byron White's even got a clay, like a detox number two. Um, yeah. You know, Supreme Nutrition's got the Takasumi and things. 
from the, from, and obviously I'm a little biased because this is um, my co-founding company or whatever with Dr. Todd Watts here, microbe formulas, but I feel like the science, you know, we have, we just have a really smart person on our team, one of the top PhDs in folic acid and, and understanding how to change it in what we've seen at least clinically with the carbons and being able to actually modify fulvic acid and humic acid to grab on to just toxins and other things and not actually bind on to minerals um, and not bind on to nutrients, which is always a concern in the charcoal category. Um, you know, okay, if I take charcoal, am I binding everything? And Generally, it's a yes. Um, you know, so you always want to take charcoal empty stomach or a clay on an empty stomach, which then you know this because you work clinically with clients too. It's like, well, then Scott, when do I take it? Right, I take this, then I take this, then I don't have time like between yep. meals and and products and um, or supplements, you know, and food. And the bioactive carbons that we have now are like unbelievable. I almost think the one with heavy metals might be even a little too strong. I've been talking with Dr. Todd about that, like um, might be binding on to too many metals at once. It might need to dose a little bit lower possibly. So, but uh, basically we have, we have bioactive carbon plus bioactive carbon number one. The one does uh, pesticides and heavy metals. And then the carbon plus does ammonia, the bad kind of aldehydes, because there's some good ones too. And then um, mold. And honestly, I'm like, because I, I get the question. I'm like, they're like, well, which one should I take? And I'm like, do I have to just pick one? Like, why can't we have both? Because mold I see as being such an epidemic issue. And the thing is, is like fulvic acid, humic acid, and the carbons and clays, they're just digestive tract, right? So you're just trying to bind them within the bile duct. But these now that we have are actually systemic. So they'll do bile and, and digestive. But now they'll actually do the full body and it's like, okay, now we're in a game changing mode right now. Um, and I don't know what's more important, right? Like what would you say is more important, mold or heavy metals or pesticides? <laughs> I would probably say mold just based on my personal experience. And yet with my own health journey, it's funny because now that I, you know, I work with practitioners that do energetic testing of various types as well. And really the only thing that comes up now is heavy metals. <laughs> so, so they're both, you know, I think at different times and a lot of it too, the mold is probably really more significant. If you're living or working in a place that has mold, you get out of that environment, you do some detox, and then probably you've got to shift your attention to other toxins that need to be pulled out. So it's nice to have tools that can really help assist with both of them. And that was actually going to be my next question is what's the difference between the bioactive carbon one and the plus. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've actually, I've got, so the, the yellow one, the one, that's heavy metals and pesticides. And then the plus is the ammonia and mold. And it's, it's, so I always go back to like practicality. Um, so when you're doing parasite cleansing or killing parasites, like there's two things that are going to happen. You're going to piss them off. You're going to make them mad because you're trying to kill them. So then they're going to release toxins, which ammonia is one of those toxins, super alkaline ends up being in pockets, you feel like crud, you drink, you try to alkalize the body with anything and it makes it worse, especially like alkaline water or something like that. So ammonia is a really nasty toxin. Um, so you make parasites mad, they release toxins. So you want to bind on to that while you're cleansing because you don't want to feel like crud and you don't want inflammation all over the body if you don't need, need it. But then the other thing is when you're doing parasite cleansing, you're killing worms. And then Whatever's inside of the worm can potentially release, which mold spores, like, you know, just mentioned can be in there. Heavy metals, big sponges for it. So I, I think there's benefits of both of them. Um, but I also think it's looking at your situation, right? So if you know you're in a moldy environment, boom. If you're one of those people that chronically has liver issues, chronically sensitive, can't do anything alkalizing, like I would definitely look into ammonia. Um, especially like strong aloide, especially like in the muscular structure. I think that was one of the things my wife dealt with, which really made it hard for her to exercise. Anytime she exercised, she'd just feel like garbage, you know, and because basically would stir that up and then, you know, the worms and things would release more ammonia and then there'd be that, that effect. So I guess if someone's listening to you, don't do well after exercise, um, definitely check the muscles for worms and ammonia 
binding would be, I think, super helpful. And I also notice a lot of times when people do far infrared sauna, if they have a towel that they're kind of wiping up the sweat and they smell it, oftentimes it does smell very strongly of ammonia. So I think that's another good clue as well. Um, were you suggesting that with these bioactive carbons that the number of minutes that they need to be taken away from other things is not as strict as what it is with some other binders or? Yeah, this is, this is what's crazy, right? Cause this is rewriting directions. Like I feel like, and obviously I'm biased, but I feel like this is going to be the game change in the functional medicine world for binders is we don't have to take carbon and charcoals by themselves in a protocol that like, for instance, these new carbons, Scott, you can take them with food. You can take them with supplements. We always recommend though, never mix mimosa pudica seed, which is the sticky, you know, anti-parasitic herb with a carbon or any other binder. Never mix it with diatomaceous earth. We know diatomaceous earth and mimosa pudica seed at the same time will neutralize it. Um, that you'll still get benefit from the DE or the diatomaceous earth, but you won't get the mimosa pudica benefit. So you want to keep that at least an hour, maybe even two hours away. You can totally do DE or diatomaceous earth, you know, while you're doing mimosa, just not at the exact same time. So, um, but always keep any binder about an hour away from mimosa pudica, I think is a good, is a good one. But otherwise like the bioactive carbons, you're eating food, take it with the food, right? Because if there's glyphosate, Think about this. If there's, and it might actually be a more important time, right? So if this one does pesticides and glyphosate and you're eating food, even if it's organic, but it's contaminated or it's, you know, conventional, and it's got more of it in there. You take that carbon with it. It's only going to be binding on to heavy metals. It's only going to be binding on to the pesticides and not going to be grabbing on to the, you know, the nutrients and things. And it, it's a lot, it's very complicated science on how it's created. It's actually an extremely expensive product to manufacture and make. Um, but it's essentially the, the, my understanding and dumbed down version of it is extracts of fulvic acid and humic acid. Um, so we say it's carbon, but it's, 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 there's a lot more to it than that. So do, do we know if it's potentially helpful to help reduce histamine reactions when people eat something that mm. they have a mast cell or histamine reaction to does taking the carbon help to minimize some of that? Or is that not known yet? That's a great question. Um, it seems as if the sensitivities to food diminish and since, I mean, not just food, but environment, it feels like the sensitivities diminish pretty substantial with the bioactive carbon. So I would imagine it's probably helping in that category, okay. but then we're also going to get into what is, I mean, what is true mast cell, right? Like when you hear people say they have a reaction, Oh, I herx, like, you know, that's being used synonymously for everything. You know, I herx, I feel like mast cell, we're going to see that too in a few years. So, Well, and a lot of the triggers for mast cell are mold and parasites, right? And so with some of these other tools that you're also talking about, if you're minimizing the trigger, I think you're helping overall with some of the reactions also over time. Let's talk a little bit now about coffee enemas. This is one of my favorite topics and probably literally saved my life at many points. It was the only thing I ever found for inflammation and pain that I could actually see a difference. It didn't matter what anti-inflammatory, what other tool, but coffee enemas, at least I could survive. And so what are your thoughts on coffee enemas um, when people don't tolerate them? Are there specific reasons why? And then are there some different approaches maybe that you have in terms of how you have clients implement a coffee enema compared to what people just kind of know um, today? Yeah, awesome question. So yeah, who doesn't want to talk about an enema, right? Putting something up the rear end. Mm -hmm. um, so when I first heard of this, I mean, I heard of it for weight loss. You know, I heard of it for weight loss years ago. Usher, the pop star, right? He did it to, you know, help, show more of his physique when he's on stage. And so I immediately coined coffee and I'm a weight loss cosmetic, like who cares, you know, just uncomfortable subject anyways to talk about enemas. And then it was years later, I had a friend, Dr. Nick, he's on, on, on my team, Dr. Nick Ellenson telling me about coffee enemas, and I wasn't even ready to hear it. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to hear about this stuff. This is kind of gross, you know? And he'd been doing them for years and he's like, gosh, they're so, they're so helpful. They're so beneficial. And finally, you know, started looking into the science of it. And my gosh, I can totally see why it helped you, Scott, because pain reduction, like at the top three tools for pain reduction, coffee enema would be in that top three, easy peasy, um, helps with detox, but it really helps open up that liver bile duct. So I love coffee enemas. 
Um, absolutely love them. I think they're so important, especially in parasite cleansing because there's parasites that love the liver bile duct area, strongyloides, giardia, uh, liver flukes, you know, all these things that live in there and can cause, you know, liver damage and liver disruption, which, you know, if there's organ issues uh, that you need to give attention to, it's definitely, you know, it's definitely liver. As far as tweaks, um, my, so Dr. S uh, Dr. Scott Richmond and Dr. Nick Ellenson on my team, we just, we, we always talk every Tuesday actually. So we're always, you know, like batting around ideas, talking about research clinically. And then of course, you know, anybody that's like hit, hit a speed bump or a roadblock always, you know, like kind of discussing and walking through. And one of the times uh, really came up coffee enemas and then it just kind of kept coming up and really started refining it and tweaking it. And I, I got to give Dr. Nick uh, on my team, you know, a lot of the credit, but basically if you add molasses, one of the, so a couple of things with coffee enemas, uh, it can be hard to hold it. So either you're putting it in too fast, you're not putting the tube in far enough. Six inches is what I recommend. Um, so you're releasing either too much liquid in you, it's releasing too fast, or it's not in far enough. Any of those three options, any combination of that can be why you can't hold it. But then there's people still, when you do that, that still can't hold it. They're like, oh my gosh, I can't, like, I only put a cup in and it's literally like, you know, all of a sudden I put it in like I feel everything internally move and it. it's like, well, it's because you're upsetting the worms. It's parasites. So if you add a tablespoon of molasses to the coffee enema solution, super easy to hold it. Um, not even sure exactly how that works or why, but molasses is thicker. So you can just go to like a Whole Foods or something and get organic molasses. You don't, it doesn't have to be the black strap or whatever, but the regular. And when you're brewing it, so I, I'll generally, I'll take four tablespoons of, coffee beans, grind them up, and then um, boil two cups of water, put it in a French press. So I've got four tablespoons of coffee, two cups of water. I let that sit there uh, for 15 minutes and steep basically, you know, French press style. Uh, but then I'll also add a tablespoon of molasses right away to it because it's nice and hot. So it'll kind of dissolve the molasses in there. After 15 minutes, I'll press the French press out. I've got uh, two more cups of water that you can, if you want to do an enema right away, just put about six to 10 ice cubes in it roughly. Um, usually eight is kind of the number, but put eight ice cubes, filtered water, and then you can also, um, I like to take some Himalayan sea salt, about a half a teaspoon, maybe a full teaspoon, and then take an essential oil, um, tangerine oil, you know, doTERRA, Young Living, wherever you get it from, uh, and put, so this, Dr. Nick taught me this too. He's like, I like to put I don't want to put the essential oils in when the water's hot because it could potentially denature the essential oils. And then now you're mixing, you know, coffee enema solution with an oil, like a water oil, like it doesn't mix super well. So what he'll do is he'll scoop, and I, I do this now, scoop a half a teaspoon of sea salt up like Himalayan or something, or even a full teaspoon, depending on how much. Um, but the reason you um, put the sea salt in is you want to get electro, you get electrolytes. It's pre preventing, you know, uh, lack of minerals and electrolytes. So easy way to add that in, but just put the five drops of tangerine oil right on the sea salt. Let that sit there for 15 minutes while your coffee's steeping. Press it down, you know, with the molasses in it. Pour that into the um, pour that into the water, um, and it's pretty much a good temp right away. And then you can put the the sea salt uh, scooper with the essential oil in, stir it up, and boom, you've got coffee enema. So four cups total. Um, you've got about a half to a full teaspoon of Himalayan sea salt with about five drops of tangerine oil. Tangerine oil helps to squeeze the liver bile duct harder. The um, minerals that are in the, uh, that's in the sea salt will help obviously, you know, give electrolytes and minerals to the body so you don't become deficient. And then the molasses just helps you hold it. And those four things, so you've got the coffee, molasses, sea salt, and the uh, essential oil tangerine, like game changer. So it's, it's a little yeah, bit, I know. I feel like I need to go now and try this out. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a little bit like what? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. My wife's always had a hard time holding coffee animals, put the molasses in fine. So then your other question you were asking like people that react, always hear this always wrong. I can't do caffeine. I can't do a coffee enema. I react. In my clinical experience, it's never been the caffeine. Never, ever, ever. Body processes it different. Yep. It is the people that react to coffee enemas. They might not be doing it right, first of all, or 
like a bad brand of coffee and there's pesticides or something the body's reacting to. I mean, there's always that possibility. But in my clinical experience, like when we lay out the instructions and here's what you do and, and all that, and I generally like to kind of to finish that, I like to do Dr. Nick uh, on my team. He'll He's like, just do all four cups, put it in. I'm like, dude, that is a ton of liquid. I don't know if I can hold all that. Um, I like to do two cups or, I mean, you don't quite get it all with all the tube, you know, stuff, but you know, you put about a cup and a half in, hold it for 15 minutes, gently release on the toilet, go back, do a second one, another cup and a half for the rest of it, you know, for another 15 minutes. That's generally kind of my, you know, Yeah. And I think even if it's even a little less for that, like if someone can only do 200 cc's or whatever, um, that's one of the challenges. I think people read and try to put too much in and then they can't hold it. And so even if you can only do 150, 200 cc's and you have to do three or four of them to use the coffee solution that you've um, created, I, I think it's still very beneficial. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I'd rather have people do smaller amounts in longer time period then try to put it all in, hold it in for two minutes. Like don't yeah. even waste your time, you know? So, um, I forget what I was going to finish with. Well, the other question about oh, the what? reaction, yeah, yeah, the reaction. So it's always the liver bile duct extremely clogged up. So in the people that react with coffee enemas, water it down, do less liquid, just start with less. Don't make it so concentrated. Don't put so much liquid in. And then also look at, you know, doing some like, carbon charcoal things, obviously the bioactive carbon, I would say right now, but, um, or do things to help soften up the bile duct, right? Like there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, herb farm has something called stone breaker. Um, Chonka Piedra, yeah. Yeah. Uh, standard process has fast food. Um, systemic formulas has something called LB liver gallbladder formula, right? Like there's just a, everybody's got something and you can mix them, but if you support that, do less. I mean, just reacting to coffee enemas, if you are, then it's got to be parasites, like just you're stirring them up. And then what I think on that, I'm like, <laughs> throw some antiparasitics in your body. I'm always herb, herbalized, you know, take a bunch of, you know, formula one and mimosa, then do a coffee enema and then take some more right after. Like if, if you know, if they're getting mad, kill them, you know, let's, let's, let's get those worms out of you. So I've heard people talk about taking binders around coffee enemas as well. And I've always kind of thought when you do the coffee enema, things are, you know, moving through the system fairly quickly. So it's not necessarily the case that there's probably enough time to fully reabsorb a lot of that toxicity with enterohepatic recirculation. But I do know some people tend to like binders around like before and after a coffee enema. Do you find clinically that that's helpful for people as well? Yes. Yep. I've been a big fan of that. I wrote about that in my first book. Um, the the thing is, is if somebody has a big toxicity issue, so helpful. If it is a massive parasite infestation, then that's when I would kind of do the antiparasitics first to bring that load down and then be switching more into the carbon charcoal clays or something, right? So if you take some a half hour before an enema, you coat the, st- you coat the intestinal tract. So when you do a coffee enema and you have that liver bile duct release, it's the catcher's mitt. And then you can take some more after to mop it up. So I I do love that idea. So one of the things with detoxification is I think people always think about binders, but if you ask most people what they're doing for drainage, there's usually nothing. So in terms of supporting the liver, kidney, lymphatic, extracellular matrix, all of these things, sometimes they're herbal, sometimes they're homeopathic, the German biological medicines, the things of that nature. Um, What are your thoughts on drainage? How important is that beyond just taking a binder? Oh, so important. And this is where I think it's just even good to define like drainage versus detox. When I think of detox, because I feel like especially in functional medicine worldwide, like everybody uses detox. Oh, I need detox. I'm like, well, what does that even mean? Like, is it a seven day juice cleanse? Is it uh, a colonic? Is it, you know, chelation? Like, what are you referencing? And so I like to think of detox in terminology for me to grasp and understand. I like to think of it as detox is grabbing on two chemicals and pulling them out of your body. I like to think of Drainage is you're just supporting the natural pathways that the body has to clear things out. Like you mentioned, the colon. So if you're constipated, draining pathway clogged. Liver bile duct is by far the most important draining pathway, bar none. I, it, if there's one to give attention to, it's that. Lymphatic, 
brain lymphatic, which, you know, glymphatic system, skin, kidneys, you know, all these draining pathways. So drainers are so important. I feel like, and not to make a blanket statement, but I'm going to here. I feel like you just can't go wrong when you drain. Like when you clear, when you, when you help the body assist in just clearing its normal gunk out in the movement, I feel like you always do better. The people that are so sensitive that react to everything, I mean, draining plugged, right? Like it's, it's the tub with toxin, like it's your bathtub with toxins. The drain is plugged and now you're like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to start detoxing. You're going to start stirring stuff up. The drain's not even open to, you know, move anything out. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. Tudka is something that I think most people in the Lyme community, if they've ever heard of Tudka, it's because of you. That's actually where I first heard about Tudka. And so I'm interested in your thoughts. What is Tudka? How is it tied in with bile, which you just mentioned? Um, what is it doing in the body? And are you still excited about it now that you've uh, had several more months to really observe people using it? Oh, yeah, Tudka. Uh, it's T-U-D-C-A is kind of the abbreviation. The the chemical name is Tororso deoxycholic acid, which everybody says Tudka because <laughs> um, I'm super excited about it. And yeah, I, I really, I believe I was kind of the bridge, you know. Um, I had heard about it actually in the weightlifting world because I was, I was looking at, you know, the people, the anabolic steroid cycle roids. And I'm like, okay, it obviously damages the liver. Like, what are these people doing to protect it? This is just my, if there's one good personality trait uh, that I have, this obsessive compulsive that if I get on something, I'm going to, you know, figure it out. And I'm like looking into liver and I was, you know, came, came up one day. I'm like, what do the weightlifters do to protect their liver? And it's like, you know, N-acetylcysteine, milk thistle, you know, all the stuff we hear about. And then I'm like, what's this Tudka? Tudka, what is this? I looked into it. I'm like, it's natural. Start experimenting with it, and yeah, soon enough, I'm like, this is flipping amazing. And I, I, I completely agree. I have found, though, clinically, it doesn't work for everybody right away. I, I do find most people do really well with it, but I think there's also timing to it. And I, I'm not sure why. Like, when I energetically test, I'm like, nope. And other times, I'm like, yeah, they absolutely need it. And I, I, I'm not sure why, but basically, it's a water soluble bile acid. And there's something about it that just opens up that pipe up, you know, that, that liver bile duct drainage pipe up. Um, so I'm a big fan of it. We actually were looking at um, having that in microbe formulas. And the only question I have, like when you actually look to source it, it's an extremely expensive raw ingredient, like so much that the ones that are for sale, unless they have a different source that we didn't find, like, I mean, they're selling it for what it would cost potentially, which is not what supplement, you know, uh, companies generally do. So I, I love it. Um, I do love it. So I, I just, cool. I find, I find it works really well. So let's talk a little bit more about heavy metals then. So obviously you've got the carbons, the, the two carbons that we talked about that people can potentially use or other products that are in the realm of binders. What are mm -hmm. some other tools that you use with clients specifically for detoxification of metals? Yeah, so I always think of like the big three. Um, and this is where I'm not sure where the future is going, the more clinical experience we get with, especially the newer carbons um, as to Cause, cause they, they're systemic, right? So it's like, well, how much, how much mercury will it pull out of your brain? I just, I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't know that yet. Um, actually my docs and I were just speaking about that this morning too, you know, that we're just, we, we literally need to observe and, and, and figure out. But, um, I always like the big three, um, DMSA in low dosing, ALA, alpha lipoic acid in low dosing as well. And then hydrolyzed clinoptolite fragment. Um, there's a couple of them out there now too, but I like, I like recruiting multiple things in lower doses is probably the easiest explanation. And I've always used like a charcoal or, you know, or a clay or some kind of binder. But now that we've got binders that are systemic, I'm like, this is even better, you know? Um, so I, I kind of like to recruit multiple things. Cause I'm thinking about Scott, when we're in the environment, like what we're exposed to, over here on the West coast versus what somebody's exposed to on the East coast is going to be different, right? Like we're going to have higher radiation and might have higher other stuff, right? If they're New Jersey in the 
you know, other areas of, of toxicity. So there's obviously, you know, toxins, heavy metals are prevalent, pesticides are huge, uh, radiation, you know, um, even thinking about the fragments of pathogens, right? When you're actually killing pathogens and you're having fragments come off. So I like to use multiple things to really kind of cast a broad net. And I feel like when you use lower dosing, like never see symptoms, you know, versus just taking one thing at a mega dose, I feel like you're more likely to react. The other thing that I would add that I think most people don't think about is the importance of trace minerals and supporting metal detox that part of the reason we hold on to a lot of these metals is because we're deficient in all of these other minerals that we really need. And so, you know, really kind of flooding the body with healthy trace minerals, I found that to be very helpful as well as kind of a foundation for a metal detox program. Yeah. And this is where, you know, Dr. Todd and I, uh, Todd Watts and I were, were speaking about too is what is more important? Is it minerals or is it more carbon? Like, cause I almost wonder too, like the, so the, so the bioactive carbon, you know, number one and plus, um, and we might, we might tweak the name a little bit. I feel like they're maybe a little too close. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> close, close in names, but, um, you know, obviously it's like sponges, right? It's grabbing onto things, but it's also really giving your body carbon. And when you look at the blueprint of the human body, you've got oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. Like that's pretty much our blueprint. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting to think maybe carbon is actually even more important than so many other things in the body. So even if there isn't any chemicals to grab onto, but the carbon's being given to the body to utilize at the cellular level, you know, mitochondrial health and other things, I mean, potentially, cool. but, that, but I, but I would completely agree on the mineral side, right? Cause you take DMSA, it's going to grab onto minerals. You take, you know, you take some type of regular charcoal or clay, it's going to grab onto minerals. So remineralizing, I really believe is super important. Yeah. especially for those with lead heavy metal toxicity because lead stored in the bone when lead comes out what's got to go back minerals yeah though i guess to your point there um probably not ideal to be taking the trace minerals when you're actively doing the dmsa for example you may actually bind up the things that you know the minerals and not so much the metals and same thing with iv chelation i think oftentimes then people have to pause on their minerals at least for a couple of days around the time of the chelation yeah. And that's, that's what I recommend. Like, so for heavy metal detoxification and, and disclaimer, like I just, I wouldn't try to heavy metal detox on your own. Cause when something comes up, like you want to coach, but uh, in general with the concept, like we'll have people go on cycle with DMSA, ALA, hydrolyzed clinoptolite fragment. We'll have them do that for maybe four or five days on and then take nine or 10 days off the four or five days on. It's all about detox. The nine or 10 days off when you're not taking the detox stuff, yeah, I mean, obviously you still want to take like carbons or whatever, but when you're not actually taking like DMSA, ALA and the hydrolyzed clonopolite fragment or you're dosing a lot lower depending on your protocol, but then that off period is all about remineralization because yeah, it's like if you're taking a bunch of that stuff and it could potentially bind on to it, you're just not grabbing onto the same amount of toxins then. But the one case I've, or the, the one scenario, I've seen this multiple times actually is people they're so deficient that they need minerals when they're detoxing because otherwise they get symptoms. So there's some people that do need minerals when they're on cycle. Um, but it's, it's not a ton of people. So yeah, I, I love minerals off. So let's touch on mold. We know that's really critical. We've talked a little bit about detoxifying potentially some of the mold exposure using the carbons. Anything that, that is kind of different about your approach to mold exposure for your clients? I feel right, right before the interview, I'm like, I got to fill my water bottle up because I know Scott's going to be loaded with great questions. So. <laughs> I know. I'm going to have to skip a few of them because we've gone into some great detail. It's been super good. Uh, mold environment. You, you have to rule it out of your environment. And if you're not sure, get somebody to help you. You have to remedy your environment or you have to relocate. Um, and it's, it's a touchy subject like you know I mentioned earlier, but that's number one. The second thing then is you got to bind on to the biotoxin, which that's where the, you know, bioactive carbon plus, I think is going to be the game changer in the functional medicine, you know, world for mold. Um, like where we used to rely on a clay or a charcoal or the, you know, Richie Shoemake trained people where they do the cholesteramine or the well call. Like, I, I don't think there's going to be any use for that stuff at all in the mold world. Now that we, you know, have, have like this tool, but, um, and then parasites like parasites, holding on to mold toxins, got to take care of them. You got to bind onto the biotoxins that you're exposed to and you got to remove yourself from the environment. Those are the three big, 
Beautiful. pieces that I see with mold. Yeah, great. So if we left out EMFs, I think we wouldn't really cover the full range of toxins that we need to, to really think about. I know you've um, done some interviews and discussions around evaluating your own, your own home for EMFs. Are there specific things that you recommend for your clients to minimize their exposure to EMFs? Have you found any of the wearable things helpful at all? What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, this is a touchy subject. Uh, because EMF, EMR allows for convenience. And, and then it's a rabbit hole the deeper you go into, especially like the research on the 5G and the wavelengths and how frequent the cell phone towers are going to have to be and how it's really resonating with our organs. Um, I mean, there's some, there's some deep rabbit holes you can go down. The, the synopsis I would tell people, because, uh, I mean, really, we just need to hear this, no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth. Like I'm in my office right now, everything's hardwired. I've got a cord, you know, connected to my, you can see I've even got one of those ferrite beads, um, you know, on it too. But everything is, everything is corded. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no Bluetooth. Even um, the, I have a light right in front of me, you know, just to help with our video interview. And I originally had those plugged in to uh, the wall. Well, LED has to convert from AC to DC, and in its conversion, these lights gave off a lot of EMFs. So now I have batteries. <laughs> so, I mean, it's really like you, you really need to look at everything in your life as far as EMF, EMR, um, because everything in our house is becoming smart, right? Fridges now have Wi-Fi. Your um, laundry, your toothbrushes, like the thermostat, like everything is becoming Wi-Fi, you know, smart home. But the more of those devices, Wi-Fi speakers, you know, I mean, we had to clean our house up just tremendously. Um, I got a couple of good interviews on EMF, EMR you know, on our website, but had to do so much work. But when we did it, oh my gosh, like peace, relaxation. Like it's just like, huh, I don't have that little tension, right? Like I just actually feel like I can relax. Yeah, sadly, I think it's uh, becoming smart home dumb person because <laughs> just the, the impact of all of these things. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, sick. It's crazy. So one of the questions, since you come from a chiropractic physician background, one of the questions someone wanted to know is how important is structural alignment and chiropractic manipulation in facilitating the body's ability to heal and removing some of these areas of stagnation or blockage? It, it's, it's another piece to the puzzle. And that's where, I guess, from a philosophy standpoint or clinical standpoint, I just don't, because I feel like when, we, when I have questions and I'm working with a client, we're always looking for what is the, what is the one thing that I'm going to do, right? So we'll change one thing and see, was that it? Nope, it wasn't. And then push it off. And then we'll change, we'll do one other thing and see if that was it. And in all reality, it's multiple things that have to be layered on each other for somebody to get well. So to try to figure out what was right or wrong is not the right thought process really necessarily in that. So then if we take a different look and say, okay, if I'm having illness, what are the things I need to do to maximize my body's healing ability? Chiropractic fits into that. It's, it's never the one size solution for everything. And, and You'll even hear like old time chiropractors, you know, oh my gosh, we used to see healing miracles every day, just giving somebody one adjustment. It's like, but you just don't see that anymore because there's such a toxicity burden on our society now that there's multiple factors that are going on. So when you really boil it down, you've mentioned this too, you've got the mind, mental, emotional stress. You've got the physical stress, which is where chiropractic and realigning the spine would help. And then you've got the chemical stress. I feel like I feel like the mental emotional stress is huge. I feel like the chemical one is probably yeah, it's so hard to pick what's is the biggest, right? And and then how many people are sitting at the computer and they're like this all day, you know? Like I'm at a I'm, you can see me moving around. I'm at a standing desk, um, so I apologize if I'm making people dizzy, but um, it's a piece of the puzzle, right? So so somebody that's like do I need a Rife machine? Do I need this or that? I'm like, it's a tool in the toolbox. And is it right for you? And I mean, everybody's got a spine, just like we all have teeth, you know, you got to brush them, go to the dentist. So 
always think of that with, with chiropractic too. Perfect. So you've done two chronic Lyme disease summits. You've done the parasite summit. What are your plans to do other summits? Uh, chronic Lyme disease number three. So, which I will, uh, I will have you on as a speaker as well. Yes. Thanks. Scott, I think I think it back. I don't know if there's anybody that's been on that will be on all three. I think you might I don't be, think so. <laughs> I think you might be the only person. So nice. I'm honored. Thanks. Kudos to you. I mean, honestly, you, you have such a great website, betterhealthguy.com, like Thanks. such a great resource of information uh, if people haven't been on there. And honestly, you, you go to more Lyme seminars probably than anybody I know or have been to. You write it out. You document it like you are a lifesaver for so Thanks. many people. So thank you very um, much. Yeah, I appreciate it. it. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to the Chronic Lyme Disease Summit number three. And I wanted to have you tell people a little bit about your new book in case they're interested. Where can they get that and what are they going to learn from it? How to Fix Lyme Disease. Yeah, so show, show, the, show the thickness of that one right there. You can see how thin that is there. So <laughs> when I wrote my first book, <clears throat> uh, Five Steps to Restoring Health Protocol, that came out a little over two years ago, maybe like two and a half years or something. I just, I'm like, it kept getting bigger. And my wife's like, you got to short, these people can't even focus. And you're having them read like 300 pages, you know? I mean, the last was like, I don't know, 50 pages of references. So in the second book, my wife's like, under 100 pages, like 80 pages. I'm like, all right, 80 it is. Well, we ended up with like 130, but it's way better than 300. So the goal was I wanted to get right to the point, which is probably the opposite of what I'm doing with this interview. No, this is great. Um, but when I get right to the point and cover the things beyond Lyme, because the, if there's anything that I would like to bring to the Lyme world is let's just not focus only on the bug. Cause if we focus just on the bug, we're getting back into the whole antibacterial soap creation. We're getting back into antibiotics or the cure all for everybody. And we know that's not right. So it, and it kind of goes back to what you're saying, Scott, like terrain. So the book is really about parasites, it's about drainage, it's about detox, it's really looking at, and then, so we created, a, my team and I, we created like a Lyme disease in under 200 seconds video or something, you mm -hmm. know, and, and my, my, uh, my brother like animated, just super cool. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was great. And, and then all of a sudden we'd start getting questions, like well, where's the research on this, where's the research on this, and how can we put any sources and, and and so from, from some of those comments, um, I went through and actually went through research on Lyme and, you know, sexually transmitted and transmitted by bugs. And you can see, I mean, there's just all the, you know, basically references behind a lot of that just to add some credibility to let's, let's get beyond just the fact that it could be spread by a tick on the East Coast or the Midwest. You know, Northern California is a epidemic area in my opinion you know there's different types yep. of ticks it's a spiral key sexually transmitted like um causes miscarriages um passed on to fetus like spread in milk like there's so many things beyond kind of the standard quota and i kind of wanted to lay that out but it's it's, it's definitely a shorter book so it's uh you know if you take a, a trip from san fran to chicago you should hopefully be able to read that on the airplane trip so awesome so I always wrap up with the question, what are some of the key things that you do in support of your own health on a daily basis? Um, set my environment up. So like right now, uh, I'm at a standing desk. I'm standing on some earthy mats. Um, I have lights on me. I don't like lights on me, but obviously for this interview, I, d I don't want to blend into the, the black background I've got. <laughs> Um, so I try not to have artificial light on me much, but obviously when I'm doing videos and, you know, video consults and stuff, I'll put them on just to make it look, you know, make it look, look, look nicer. But really I think about everything throughout my day that it's really boiling down to either it's taking energy away from me or it's building energy or health up. And you never can be in a perfect world where everything's building you up. But when I... <laughs> When I look back, like a, even a year year ago, I mean, I get done at four or five o'clock at night, six o'clock. I, mean, I used to work some crazy hours. I mean, I still work a lot, but um, and I'd just be burnt out. And I had a, a industrial Wi-Fi router five feet from my head. I had a Sonos Wi-Fi router. My laptop was Wi-Fi. My 
keyboard and mouse for Bluetooth. I had a Wi-Fi printer like all within five feet of me. And it was like, I, I wasn't at the conscious level to think about my environment. So I think environment, super important. I always get sleep. Like nothing's, I, I don't care what's going on. I'm going to get eight hours of sleep. Like so, so important. Obviously there's, you know, all right, my daughter has a bad dream or something or comes wakes us up, right? There's always those, those things, but sleep so important. Um, and then just taking time for myself. I look at one of the things I look, I like to look at and not from a judgmental standpoint so much, but I like to look at, okay, if there's a quote unquote health expert out there, like how is their health? Like how is their life? How is their stress level? And what I find like you can find people that are absolutely brilliant in an area or two of life, but then they're missing the boat on something else. And I think, I, I really think true success is when you're successful in all areas of your life, parenting, marriage, finances, health, you know, emotionally, spiritually, like you have all the categories. Um, and I feel like that overall is, is so impactful for your health too, because any area not doing well is of course going to be a stressor, which then can negatively affect your health too. Absolutely. Fantastic. That was really good. So you are a machine. You have shared so much great information over the years, so many great interviews. I will put your website in the show notes as well because people should absolutely go check out the interviews. I'm constantly sharing them on my pages as well, but <laughs> drjdavidson.com, go check it out. I appreciate you being here today. It was really fun for me. I learned some new things. I wasn't expecting to learn about the upgraded coffee enema and all that kind of stuff. So super, super great. I appreciate everything that you do to help people lead a healthier, happier life and just want to thank you very much for being here today. It's been a pleasure, Scott. Awesome. Thanks so much. To learn more about today's guest, visit drjdavidson.com. That's drjdavidson.com. drjdavidson.com. I appreciate your support of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. If you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Better Health Guy. The show can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. And if you'd like to be added to my newsletter, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. I'm looking forward to many more shows ahead and appreciate your interest. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.